pass to Leitner. Puts it up. You're listening to the Culture State Podcast. Get ready. Woo! Welcome back to the Culture State Podcast right here. I am the man with the U-Haul boxes in the back. My name is Chris Lee. That cool guy with the Durham Bull shirt on, his name is? I'm Dennis Cox. Don't get it wrong. Yeah, we can't get it wrong. And you got all the cool figurines in the background, too. All the collectibles right there. He's about to make some money off of those. No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Maybe one day. But not you just got to wait until you find your love that works at the eBay store, and then she'll make you sell them, and then you'll get upset with her and all that type of stuff, right? I get what you're saying. <laughs> 40 year old virgin uh reference even though um i don't know anything about his love life uh so hey mr cox um we have a very special guest on the show today his name yeah, is well some people call him cycle t mm-hmm. a lot of people call him T- tyler hands bro i think he would prefer to be called tyler hands bro or the big hawk the big hawk <laughs> I'm gonna, we're, we're gonna ask him about that chris about you know, the nickname psycho t where it came from how he thinks about it but Tyler Hansbro is he's he's one of those people that either you loved him, you hated him, or you loved to hate him. Yeah. He's kind of like similar to maybe what Grayson Allen or JJ Reddick were at Duke. And yep. if you're making that local comparison, but yeah, that's kind of who he was at UNC. Fantastic player. Let's not take anything away from him, but that's kind of how he was viewed, you know, depending on what color blue you wore. Absolutely. I, I think. I would compare him more to JJ Reddick as far mm-hmm. as the the love or hate that he got, just mainly because those two were just so good. They were they were really good college players. Oh yeah. And when you think of maybe the perfect college basketball players who stay for four years, who really represent the universities they're they're for, and then they go there and they break records. It's it's those two. You know, yeah. you think about that. JJ Reddick and, and Tyler Hansbro. Um, Grayson, you know, he stayed for the four years. Grayson is uh he's not he wasn't the guy that was gonna absolutely like kill you and light it up. He can have like really good games. He was a consistent guy. Uh, but I think more people more so didn't like him because of uh the emo- emotional outbursts and the the tripping and all that. Oh yeah, he was tripping. I think that was a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so that's fair but again it's again it's still either um you mm-hmm. liked him or you hated the guy yeah. you know there's there's a lot of players out there i always think recently like zion it's like you may not have mm. quote unquote cheered for him because he maybe played for a team you didn't cheer for or you didn't like but it's like okay i like that guy though like there's a re- there's a respect for that guy but there's yeah. just some like like blood boiling hatred that for some reason tyler hansbro just brought out in people yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he was so good. It, when you have yeah. somebody like that that's so good, it was almost kind of like the uh, the Sam Cassell effect in the NBA mm-hmm. where there's a while where I felt like I hated watching Sam Cassell because he didn't look like he was supposed to be that good. Yeah. But it was like he'd take over at weird times in the game, and it's like, how can we not stop this guy? And so yeah. I think that's what Tyler Hansbro like, kind of gave off. Like, yeah, you know, he's sure. big. He's talented, but he was never the freak athlete. No. He was never the amazing shooter. Um, you know, he was he was pretty good at all that, but he was always there for every rebound. Mm-hmm. He got all the putbacks. He got fouled all the time. He was at the line. And he seemed to make all his free throws. And when it comes down, like, it's the basics of basketball. He was so good at that and better than your number one. And it's like, yeah. stop this guy. <laughs> Why, why, why are you so damn good? Stop it! It's like, like <laughs> hey, oh, if, if you watch, if you ever went to a game in the stands, or you just watch it at home, if you if you were rooting against UNC, it was just like, what, how does that guy still? Do, how does he score there? Like, how? Yeah. Why is he always grabbing that rebound? Like, how is he doing that? It's it's the same mindset that everyone had when it came to him. Like, you're right. You're 100 right regarding that. And when you talk about perfect guests for this show and what the show mm-hmm. is about, as far as um, celebrating the state of North Carolina, like we had PD Pablo, yep. you know what I'm saying? We had Matt Hardy, mm-hmm. uh, we had Ninth Wonder on Big Poo. Yep. You know, this guy right here, Tyler Hansbro, is like the perfect guy that you think about because oh, he yeah. was he was it was so impactful his four years at North Carolina, and I would argue to say that it's the best player that. Um, that Roy Williams coached for four years. Yeah. 
while at North Carolina. Um, you know, there's other players that were really impactful, maybe went to the NBA a little bit early, but for a four year player, um, you know, taking away what you may you think he may or may not have accomplished, uh, you know, professionally, but he's still playing professionally, though. That's mm-hmm. the thing. He still has a career. So, uh, you know, he's still doing his thing. He uh, is probably the the best player that Roy Williams had and, and I think really helped set the tone for what the North Carolina Tar Heels uh, was supposed to be. Oh, won a national championship. Yep. So let's talk to the man right after this, Tyler Hansborough. Big Hulk. All right, welcome back to the Culture State Podcast. Uh, my man Dennis Cox and myself here with Tyler Hansborough, former North Carolina uh, superstar. I mean, you know, we call it what it is, one of the best players in North Carolina history. Also, uh, NBA career, overseas career, and now, you know, maybe a budding broadcaster. Who knows? What, what, what's, what's in the plans for later? There, there is no uh, blueprint <laughs> for me right now. I'm uh, still working hard, still planning on going playing overseas. So I'm just having fun. Uh, obviously, I started a podcast, Sleephawk Worldwide. Uh, great podcast. We cover everything. Anything our listeners want us to cover, we'll cover it. But uh, yeah, then I started the broadcast uh, last, uh, I guess, last year for the North Northeastern game uh, UNC played. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm just kind of having fun right now. Who knows? What's it like stepping on the other side of of the camera as opposed to being on the court playing and now you're behind the court calling games. Like what's the, how's that different for you? It's much easier. Uh, <laughs> one, you get to be a Monday coach. You can see the mistake and then you say, well, they should have done that. And so from that aspect, it's much easier. Um, but, uh, it's not a lot of pressure. Um, but, um, most of the time you just got to realize not a lot of people are really <laughs> even paying attention, uh, until you, uh, you know, make a joke or say something, but, uh, yeah, it's a little different. I mean, I would still consider myself a rookie at this, but you know, it's fun. Yeah. It was cool to to see you uh, on the game because, uh, I think a lot of, I think before, um, you doing the game before the, the podcast, a lot of people kind of saw you as just a quiet guy. So it was like, Whoa, Tyler's doing a, a, a game and all that. So is, is that, is that something you've gotten from a lot of fans? Like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that, you know, you, uh, you would want to do that. You seem like you're a little bit more reserved and quiet. No, I'm definitely more reserved and quiet. Uh, especially if, uh, especially if you don't know me, uh, I'm usually uh, a little more vocal with, uh, friends and stuff like that, but, uh, you know, I've gotten more comfortable and, um, you know, I just enjoy doing the game. Also, it's in the studio, so it's hard to see uh, who's really paying attention. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you say you're looking to go back to playing basketball overseas. What's the process been like that for you? Because it's been a little bit, you know, since you played last. Yeah, so I had to sit out uh, because of COVID. Um, I had COVID, and once you get COVID uh, in certain leagues, you um, I was still testing positive for the antibodies and the league that I was playing in. If you tested positive for the antibodies, then uh, you couldn't get into the country. And so at the time, and uh, but uh, no, I've been very lucky to play in China. And uh, I love China. I love playing in China. I love the fans in China. It's a great place to play basketball. There's a huge basketball market there. Uh, it's a very competitive league. And so I've enjoyed it from that aspect. And uh, it's really forced me to improve <clears throat> and work on aspects of my game that uh, I necessarily didn't work on in the NBA because uh, you're more of a – you kind of have that role player being a rebounder, screener, defender, uh, opportuni- you know, opportunity scorer. And <clears throat> so in the China League, you know, it was like, you know, you got to score. you got to do certain things. So you got to improve your game to stay over there. And uh, I've really enjoyed it. So what are you doing more? Are you you uh, shooting more, shooting more threes, handling the ball more, coming off uh, a pick and rolls yourself with you know, handling the ball? What what is Tyler Hansbrough's game in in China now? Yeah, uh, you know it's it's more of score. You know China's China's a very physical league, like most international leagues. Uh, I would I would classify as China as the most physical league in the world. Uh, I would say it's about like the NBA in the eighties, and so mm. there's a lot of post up. They have a lot of bigs. And so it's old school, um, tough basketball. And uh, that's what they play in China. So I've had to expand my game as far as, you know, different areas on the floor where I can score, 
uh, I wouldn't say they're, you know, I'm handling the ball off a of pick and roll, but, uh, you know, I've, I've improved my ball handling drastically, bringing up the court much more comfortable and uh, really became, really have become more of a, uh, diverse basketball player. And it's been real fun. I enjoy that. I enjoy working on the game and growing. Of course, uh, when you're at Carolina, you you scored a lot there as well. Um, you know, you did your thing. But, you know, outside of actually, like, uh, playing there uh, for the four years you were there, if I want to get your thoughts on the NIL you would have been paid <laughs> like, like just keep it straight up. Like you would have been, you know, you know, probably been able to retire after graduating uh, if you wanted to and just live out the rest of your life because um, you know, you were, you were just that guy during that time. What are your thoughts during uh, for that? And do you think you would have, uh, you know, brought in a bunch of money, had a lot of great opportunities while in college? Yeah. Well, it's, I'm not sure how much money I would have brought in, uh, but it would have been nice to have the opportunity. And I think from my aspect, it's much, it's, it's beyond overdue. And the fact that it's taken this long for kids to actually have the opportunity to get paid off of, you know, their, you know, their, their name and their likeness and their image. Um, it, to me, it's kind of comical that it took this long. And, you know, the NCA has really failed the student athlete in many aspects. Um, you know, you take a business school uh, kid on scholarship and they develop a software program. They can sell that software program to any any company in the world and they can do a paid internship and they can use their software company. But not for not for a college athlete. I compare it to the same thing. And why can't a college athlete just go out and, you know, post something on Instagram and then go get a free meal? Uh, I don't think what you're seeing here is a lot of college kids getting paid millions of dollars. They just want to you know, make a few, few extra bucks and have the opportunity to do that. And I think it's really good because a lot of college kids will make these connections with these local companies or national companies if they're lucky, and they're going to develop these relationships. And then it's just going to set them up even more for connections in the job after they're done playing. And I think it's a real good thing and I like it, but we'll see where it goes. Yeah, I've always told people like, you know, in college, I could go to I went to 102 Jams in Greensboro, got a job, was able to work, get paid while also studying broadcasting. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's the same concept. I was able to get a job at the Greensboro News and Record and, you know, make money. I mean, not a lot of money, but make money while I was studying, um, you know, journalism as well. So it's just, you know, it is interesting. It is uh, beyond time. Uh, and um, but it's also one of those things where I think it's kind of ridiculous that even if it has nothing to do with basketball, if you are an artist of some sort, if you have music, you can't even, you couldn't have before, couldn't even go make money off of your music or you couldn't even play basketball on Saturday. And that, that is part of the, what's ridiculous to me about it. Yeah. And um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of silly rules out there. And I think one of the most, one of the silliest rules I've heard of is when the UConn player after national championship or whatever came out and said, Hey, I'm just trying to get a meal. Like I, I'm really struggling here. I want to get a meal, and then all of a sudden, the NCAA now they're allowing kids to, you know, have meals in certain times and after the game. And you know, a lot of this stuff was just ridiculous, and a lot of it's just common sense. And uh, but it sounds like we're heading in the right direction, regardless of how I feel uh, about how they handled things in the past. I think we're actually learning this, and I don't think it's going to be a smooth process. I think it's going to take time to get, and I think it's going to become smooth, and people are going to be more comfortable with it. But I think a lot of a lot of issues that people had with it is they didn't want a lot of college kids making, you know, a ton of money and then just blowing it, and then so to me, what? <laughs> it's their money. They're adults. Yeah, yeah. you're you're you try right. to manage it. I understand that, but if you look at every business, there's somebody out there that makes a ton of money. You know, I don't care what age range they're in. They're blowing their money, too. And why do they care about the young kid? Why do they care about the young uh, adult doing it? And to me is uh, also what we haven't seen is we haven't seen all these kids. They're not all making million or million dollars or like NBA money. It's just like a little money here and there. And a lot of a lot of the uh, the athletes that are making money or getting these endorsements, <clears throat> they're not all the football players or the basketball players. Like what Barstool did is they went after people who have 
huge presence on social media. And so they gave them sponsorships. And so, you know, at UNC, I could see a lot of women's soccer players uh, getting good deals and mm. making sponsorships and then doing, you know, autograph signings. And so I think all around, it's good for everybody. And a lot of people are missing that picture. I spoke to one parent of a student athlete recently, and he got a, a part time job. And, you know, all because of that's the money that he wanted to make to send his kid uh, some money while they were in school, uh, because he's like, even though he's on scholarship, there are certain things that the scholarship doesn't cover. And so he still needed to have that, um, you know, and and I thought that was kind of eye opening uh, to me as well. Is just that, you know, here it is this parent that's worked so hard to support their kid to get them to this point to where they can get this to this level. Now they have to get a, a part-time job just so they can keep their kid. And, and you would think that this person would have everything taken care of, but everything isn't taken care of. Maybe, I mean, I don't know if you could speak to that, that portion of it and what, what the scholarship doesn't cover. Um, but that was something that was kind of eye opening to me. Yeah. And I agree with that. Um, you know, I always use, use this example is, you know, people come from different backgrounds. Not everyone has money or has um, the opportunity to go to North Carolina. So we recruit a lot of players, you know, nationally, just like every big time division one school. And so you take uh, a kid who comes from a background where there's not a lot of money and you take that kid, you know, let's just say they're, you know, they're a they're a West Coast high school and then they go to a college in the East Coast. And so for that family to travel and see their kid and then pay all those that expenses, that's a lot of money. And so I don't understand why when we recruit somebody or a college recruits somebody that's in South Carolina, North Carolina, you know, East Coast, and they recruit somebody in the West Coast that doesn't have a lot of money, why, why when they see their kid that's making a ton of money for the school, why they can't get a free hotel room or some type of travel plan or discount when they come and see their kid. To me, that's always been something that I just can't get over, and I, I've never really understood why they would limit that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's just something that not a lot of people see. But you're right about the scholarship. It doesn't cover everything. And uh, But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm sitting here bashing this flawed system. It, North Carolina, to me, is the best university in the world, and it always will be. And I was lucky to go here and the scholarship did do a lot. And just being part of this program was huge for me. But uh, I think as a whole, I'm not I'm not talking negatively on that. I'm just saying as a whole, the system needs to be fixed. Yeah. Carolina is on the forefront, though, with the with the group licensing deal. So, I mean, they were the first uh, school in the country to do so. So I feel like they're taking the right steps for their athletes in the future. Yeah. yeah, I think we're proactive at it. And I think we're one of the schools that realizes that this is going to be a great opportunity, not only for the school, but for the uh, athlete, not only for the athlete, but for the school as well. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm extremely excited that uh, UNC is, you know, being as active as they are and trying to see what they can do. Uh, but like I said, you know, this is going to take some time. A lot of schools have no idea what's going on. And some of this is kind of, you know, it's not all that clear. So it's going to take a while for people to get a feel for it, what they can do and how to uh, really make the most of this opportunity. Now, speaking of Carolina, I want to go back to your time there. Your, your head coach there, Roy Williams, just recently retired. What was it like playing for, for Coach Roy? And also, what do you think of Hubert Davis coming in? Uh, well, <laughs> Coach Williams, to me, is the best. He'll always be the best. And I was lucky. I learned a lot from Coach uh, Playing for him was was an honor. Um, you know, he taught me a lot, uh, a lot about hard work and how to do things the right way. And that's probably the most important um, thing that I'll take away from playing for him. But, yeah, we had a lot of good memories. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of what we did at Carolina. And I'm happy for Coach Williams that he's retired. Seems extremely happy. And uh, I'm excited that he's going to spend a lot of time with his family. Um, I, I'm actually supposed to golf with them here in a couple of days, so I'm excited about that. But yeah. Coach Davis, Hubert's going to do a great job. I'm excited. Um, you know, I think he's a great person, and uh, the kids, uh, the team really likes him, and they're working hard. So uh, I'm really excited. I'm ready to pull for them and see what they can do. 
Um, as far as um, the actual state of North Carolina, you're from Indiana, but when you came I'm here, like, you said what? I'm from Missouri. Missouri. I'm sorry. I was thinking about the Pacers. It's my yeah. fault about that. From Missouri. Um, uh, when you came here, you first uh, came to, to the state. Um, what is it about this place that uh, that you started to uh, to like and, and started to, um, I guess, uh, fall in love with outside of the university. What is it about this state that, that, you know, kind of, uh, attracted you a little bit? Well, for me, um, I always make this point very clear. I came to UNC because of coach Williams. Mm -hmm. Uh, I liked how honest he was with me. He told me I was going to have to work for everything and earn my starting position. He didn't make any guarantees or any promises. Uh, so that was the type of person that I wanted to play for. And, uh, my high school coach, everyone that talked to him really liked him. And it uh, seemed very genuine. So I wanted to play for a coach like that. And then once I got to UNC, I realized how much I liked the campus outside of the, you know, the pretty campus um, and, you know, the, the weather and everything, um, except for how hot it gets in the summer. Uh, <laughs> the people are great. I love the people. I think the people make the university and uh, the community is really good. So I've always enjoyed it here. And uh, it's been a special place to me ever since. And, you know, I'm extremely comfortable here as well. The no. zebra cobra doesn't uh, scare you away? Yeah, yeah the zebra cobra. <laughs> <laughs> hey, were you covering the zebra cobra? Uh, I'm in sports, so luckily I didn't have to go out there <laughs> to yeah. do it. I can stay in the studio. But the main thing I was wondering is, like, man, I hope, especially when we found out this thing was uh, been loose since November, uh, it wasn't loose just for a couple of days. It was loose since November of last year what yeah <laughs> and so i was like this thing could have been out like yeah. mating and so we probably have you know copperhead zebra cobra <laughs> hybrids or whatever think about that i i snakes i don't know i just don't like snakes i don't want to see a snake uh yeah i i don't know that was a whole weird situation it seemed like the more research they did on it kept getting weirder and weirder i don't know how anybody owns any type of cobra uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad I was far away from there. I was actually in California when all that was going on, but, uh, yeah, it makes me feel good to know that it was, it was, uh, it was on the loose for about a year now. <laughs> all right. Now, Tyler, during your time at UNC, you got the nickname psycho T. I want to know your thoughts on that nickname. Well, um, <laughs> the, the person that gave that nickname to me is, uh, is Jonas Serration, the strength coach, strength and conditioning coach for UNC uh, basketball. Um, <laughs> it seemed it seemed funny at the time, and uh, it was kind of we laughed about it uh, because I was so quiet, and reserved, and then in the weight room for one day, I just started, you know, I was joking around, started screaming, and he called me psycho. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, and so he doesn't. <clears throat> he never calls. He never calls me that anymore. And uh, a big reason he doesn't do it is because everyone else calls it. Everyone else calls me uh, Psycho T. <clears throat> but I think it's funny. Uh, it's kind of misleading at times because when people meet me, they expect me to be crazy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, nah, it's it's a funny little name, and we joke about it. But he doesn't call me that anymore. Where does Big Hawk come from? Big Hawk. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, my podcasting nickname. Uh, we got that on the golf course, just kind of messing around. Uh, my co-host is Big Sleep Dog. Uh, he got it in college from falling asleep when we used to go out. I don't know why he did that, but <laughs> just fall asleep. So uh, we call him Sleep. They call me Big Hawk uh, because I'm not even sure. It came about on the golf course for some weird reason. I, I seem to be in the woods a lot, so they just call me Big Hawk. But <laughs> Now, something else you're famous for at UNC was the whole the bloody nose thing. Do you still get Oof. people bringing that up to you all the time? Oh, like yeah. you just did? <laughs> yeah, like, like exactly, like I just did. Exactly. The, you know that one gets. There's kids that come up to me and ask me about that, and I said you weren't even alive when that happened. <laughs> I mean, how do how do you know about this? But uh, <laughs> nah, it was fine. I mean, I joke it's. It's funny. Yeah, it's amazing how many people remember that. I guess they didn't even watch the game. They just see, you know, the commercials and everything like that. Well, it's just an iconic image, you know? Oh, it's yeah. Just, that's the thing. It's just it's yeah. just that image. Like, wow, Tyler Hansborough getting up, just blood running down his mm -hmm. face. It's, it's, it's an iconic image. So I'm sure you get people 
hey, you don't have to be alive to still recognize that photo. I, I feel like, you know what I liken it to? It, it, it was one of those things where I don't know if you watch wrestling, Tyler, but like when, when Stone Cold went against uh, Bret Hart and he yep. was he had that blood running out of his face. And it was like that was one of the moments that made Stone Cold Steve Austin. Mm -hmm. And then I, I felt like looking back, like that was the moment it was like, man, this dude is like a superstar. Like, yeah, he got hit into that hard. He's bleeding. And then he's still going to throw like drop 40 on you <laughs> and grab all the rebounds. I remember when I got drilled and uh, I was laying on the ground and I wiped my face. I didn't even know I was bleeding that much. But as soon as I stood up, I was I was bleeding so much that I was trying to kind of stop my nose from bleeding. But, uh, yeah, looking back on that, I don't know if you guys know the background, but I tell people that I didn't know Gerald Henderson elbowed me. I thought it was actually Demarcus Nelson. And so I was pretty pissed. And I didn't know I was bleeding literally until I looked at my hand. And at the moment, it didn't hurt that much. It wasn't that bad. And so I got up and I was going, I was going to go after Demarcus Nelson because uh, I thought he did it. But uh, that, would have been, that would have been really bad because I wouldn't have got the guy that actually elbowed me. But, um, yeah, that, uh, that is an iconic moment. Mm. Have you talked to Gerald Henderson about that since? Yeah, we have. I mean, I talked to Gerald. We used to do – we actually did uh, like a podcast for – it wasn't that long. But, uh, yeah, we, we talked about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean – we're over. And when we talked about it on that podcast we did, uh, he admits it was a cheap shot. I mean, I don't know how you defend it wasn't a cheap shot. Even he admits it. But, uh, you know, it's just the way it plans, it, just the way it happened. And uh, things happen like that when you get competitive. But, uh, no, nah, there's no hard feelings anymore here. Um, outside of uh, you playing basketball, um, when you're looking at sports, like who do you cheer for? What sports do you enjoy uh, watching and sitting down and, and following something that maybe people wouldn't even realize? Hmm. Uh, let's see here. Um, I don't know. I'm, I love golf. Um, I'm a big golfer. So uh, I watch a lot of golf. Um, but in this Olympics, I've watched everything. Uh, I've watched weightlifting. Um hmm. I really liked the track and field. My dad was my dad was a track and field athlete at yeah. Mizzou, so I uh, grew up loving track and uh, high jumping in high school or in junior high and high school a little bit. And uh, my dad was a high jumper, so I enjoy that stuff. But I like all sports. Um, uh, I really don't have a team uh, because. Uh, the Rams, they used to be my football team, but when they moved out of Missouri, out of Missouri and went uh, big time to L.A., I, um, I stopped pulling for them. But uh, I can't pull for the Chiefs because they're too good now and everyone else just kind of <laughs> Chiefs. And so I don't want to jump on that bandwagon. So, And now I can't pull for Tampa Bay because Tom Brady just went there and now <laughs> – the bandwagon so i'm still searching i'm a free agent in football so uh hopefully i'll i'll figure it out do you do you know b dot who play who uh worked at 102 jams no uh -uh. okay so b dot is a he's uh he works at 102 jams he's a big carolina fan he's he's one of those guys that you've probably seen pictures of him at carolina um uh, games where he's like he's got the little ram's head he goes crazy and all that type of stuff but anyway he um He's from St. Louis. And so when the Rams moved, like he was a big Rams fan as well. So when the Rams moved, he actually did like uh, something on social media where he <laughs> tried to get people to, you know, basically tell him which team. And I guess he had people take votes and he ended up be becoming a Cowboys fan because of it. Oh, it's, it's weird yeah. for the Cowboys, but I was for the Cowboys. There's two <laughs> out there full for the Cowboys that never even been to Texas. But <laughs> my point is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was going to pull for wherever Aaron Rodgers was going to go. Uh, I wanted a team out there to get Aaron Rodgers, and I wanted him to go to whatever team he was going to go to. I was going to pull for that team because I really didn't think uh, Green Bay appreciated what they had. They have one of the greatest quarterbacks of, of our lifetime, and they act like he's nobody. And so I was pissed off about that. And so wherever, wherever Aaron Rodgers was going to go, that was going to be my team. But uh, he's back at Green Bay, so I'm, I'm thinking about pulling for him, but I'm not really sure. 
or you know you could leave it in the hands of your fans you know uh, do a little poll see what people think uh i mean i would say carolina panthers myself but you know yeah. do it for the home team that might you know we'll see about that maybe, <laughs> maybe. I, don't, I don't know sounds good so uh i know you're trying to you're getting ready to try to play this season um is something already in the works or are you expecting to to go work out with some folks or whatever uh for you know this upcoming season I mean, there's always something in the works. It just, uh, you know, it just, it's just to, uh, you have to get to a point where, you know, all right, let's finalize it. Uh, no, there's always talks going on. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm waiting on some information and uh, for some things to be finalized, and we'll see. But, no, I plan on going overseas. And, uh, yeah, I'm hopeful that maybe China will let uh, – Foreigners play this year. There's been some rumors that they're not. I would love to go back into China and play. I love China. I love playing in China, but uh, we'll see. And this is my final question for you. Um, your time with the Hornets, um, you know, being that MJ was your boss and, you know, of course, one of the greatest Tar Heels ever. Um, did you have any, um, I guess, MJ run-ins with him? Did he ever try to take you in a court? And be like, let me show you what to do. You know, any, any actual MJ moments like that? Because he always seems to have these iconic stories of uh, trying to outplay some of his players or other Carolina guys. Yeah. I love the stories too. It seems like you get better, <laughs> better uh, over time. Now, nah, I mean, I love my time. I love playing for the Hornets and my time there is quick, but uh, no, I got a better story about MJ when I was in college. Um, I might've been a year out of college or in college. Uh, some, somehow MJ was at top up. And uh, he was eating dinner. I didn't know it. I walk in Topo. Usually when I walk in Topo, you know, you know, see a pe few people point at me and kind of look. I walk in Topo. I'm just like, I look around. No one even gives it. Like, <laughs> no one's, <laughs> what the hell's going on? And then I turn and I go towards the back. And there is just a mass of people just out with their phones looking. And there's MJ and uh, a bunch of his buddies uh, eating dinner. <laughs> and so... I walk over to him and I dap him up and I said, damn, man, you can't even let my head, let me have my time in top of the hill tonight. Huh? You got to take everything from me. <laughs> and so I thought that was funny. But that's a, I'm, no, he, uh, I've never seen him lace it up, but uh, he's given us a few talks when I was with the Hornets that were pretty motivating. So nice. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us today. This was, uh, it was really fun. And, um, yeah, hopefully uh, we get a chance to see you overseas at some point, and hopefully you can stay out of the way of the zebra cobras and the hybrids that it may have made since November and all that good stuff. <laughs> for sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Let's go. Y'all hear the music, baby? That means culture stays in the building. Uh. I was going to bust out a freestyle, but I'm not going to do that right now. Uh, Tyler Hansbro, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> I will say this, though. This is one of those interviews that we had to be very patient with. Oh, yeah. Um, because we were trying to get this thing done for like two months. And uh, thanks to you, Chris, for putting all the legwork you did, talking with Tyler and coordinating the time. That was 100% on you, man. So all the props to you, sir. I mean, yeah. it's it, – but I will say this. That's one of the things about um, getting the, the really big names – um, for this podcast is sometimes you just got to be patient because people have schedules yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and people have you know, schedules and they don't owe us anything. They don't, they, owe us, they don't owe us one second of their time. He didn't have to do this. So we are very much so appreciative that he did do this. And, um, you know, when you are Tyler Hansbro, um, there's different things you have going on. Uh, same thing with Petey Pablo. Same yeah. thing with Matt Hardy. Same thing with anybody. I mean, Amber I Nichols, <laughs> you know, anybody who's who's been on the show, uh, you know, they we thank you because there's no show without you guys. Uh, so uh, we're more than willing. And there's a few people right now that we're still waiting for when it yes. comes down to schedules. <laughs> so trying to <laughs> we're keeping our fingers crossed. Yes, it's a big much. names. So big names. But, yeah. you know, we want to thank the people who have done it and the people who are still considering doing it. It's just that we're working with your schedule right now. You know, but. Chris, you, you brought up something about Tyler that that stuck out with me. You mentioned we talked about the bloody nose um, when he got Gerald Henderson caught him in the face. Yeah. So anytime that you watch the Duke North Carolina rivalry, that image shows up. That's just an iconic image when it comes to that rivalry and really just college sports in general. It's 
-hmm. always come back to this thought of how us as people, we have these, these captions, these moments, these memories that really stand out to us, whether it's from a sporting event, from a, something in our personal life, you know, you and I are wrestling fans. You brought up the comparison with WrestleMania 13, Stone Cold, Bret Hart, the he's in the sharpshooter. He's his face is up. He's screaming in pain and the blood running down his face. That was a moment mm -hmm. that defined him. And it's a moment that sticks in our images you know, for, for our lifetime, we can remember seeing that for the first time. No one remembers the layup with seven minutes left in the first half. No one remembers that, but something like that, that always stands out and it's forever going to stand out in that UNC Duke rivalry. And the fact that Carolina won that game. Yeah. <laughs> Carolina. Yeah, that's true. Carolina won that game. And this dude, you know, was just clocked in the face, bleeding all over the place and still went out there and won a game. Yeah, he went out there and balled, I mean, too. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, I think it, he kind yeah. of proved his toughness. Yeah, in that absolutely. Game. 100%. Absolutely. Um, yeah, thank him so much for, for being on the show. Uh, it, it was uh, great having him. And I think one of the things, too, is, uh, I mean, he, he discussed it as well, where, you know, he is kind of, it seems like a, a very quiet guy. And, you know, I, I may have told you this before, uh, uh, just in, in private conversation, but there was a time when I was in college and every time I would go to to UNC to go uh, visit, you know, a friend or to, you know, go for Halloween or something on Franklin Street or whatever. Yeah. It was like this streak of time. I, every time I went to UNC Chapel Hill, I would see Tyler Hansbro walking while we were driving <laughs> by himself, though. You yeah. know, you'd see other basketball players or football players and they were always with people. Tyler was always walking by himself. And it was like five times in a row. And I didn't even say this to him, but it was like five times in a row in a row. I went to Carolina and it was like, oh, there's Tyler Hansrow again walking. Um, and so I was just like, man, he really doesn't talk to anybody. So I didn't I didn't know what we we're going to get out of this uh, interview. Uh, he was a great interview, though, like you know, very engaging and gave a lot of great answers. And he seems like he'd be the type of guy where if you sat down with a beer and you guys could just talk all night about just different things. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I'm gonna be honest. I didn't. I didn't know what we were gonna get. To tell you the truth, no, hundred percent. I didn't know what we were gonna get either. And he was great. He was awesome. And I think you know, he even admitted himself that you know yeah, I can be quiet and reserved, but when I get comfortable and around you, I'll I'll start opening up and cutting up. So I can yeah. I can definitely see that he's out in the open. I mean, obviously he told that story where he you know top of the hill is showing up, but Jordan's there and he's like, oh okay, no one's actually paying attention to me. I, as you're the you are literally the big man on campus. Yeah, and. Yeah, you don't get a lot of private time. So I can see how someone like that can be reserved. Yep. Um, he's he's been doing great. Uh his podcast is out. If you want to go check it out, I think it's called Sleep Hawk Worldwide. So go uh check that out. They even have an Instagram for it. Uh him and his co-host on there. Um, you know, so go listen to him. He's doing his thing. Um, trying to get back into China right now. We'll see what COVID 19 allows him to do. Um, oh. but uh Big Hawk still doing his thing. We might need a part two at some point with Big Hawk. So, um, of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Of course. So thank you guys so much for listening and watching. If you're watching us on YouTube right now uh, for the Culture State Podcast, we've got a great episode coming up for you next week. Wes Durham of the That's ACC right. Network. Legend. He's going to join us. Yo, the sign is real simple, B. It says wrap it up. Wrap it up, B. This is over. Culture State. The Culture State Podcast, part of the Capital Broadcasting Podcast Network, with new shows coming out every Wednesday. Download and subscribe from wherever you get your podcasts, including the WREL Sports Fan app.